This one was a long time coming, wasn't it? Usually, when I broach the topic of the most prominent degenerates in any given medium, it hinges on the idea that we are, indeed, dealing with a niche, too small to attract the due scrutiny necessary to root out the degenerates within it, hence their continued presence. However, when we're talking about anime, the story is very different. Though, obviously, the entire genre of anime cannot be blamed, nor should it be associated with the kind of degeneracy people engage in under its umbrella. But, of course, it's worth noting how prevalent every kind of sordid abnormality seems to be in the world of anime. It's not just an undercurrent. As a matter of fact, it's so mainstream that it's actually the root of problems in other fandoms. For one example of this, Take the common tropes of yandere and tsundere characters, which were largely popularized by anime and now infest Western cosplay culture and TikTok. But it goes much beyond that. Oversexualized minors being referred to as lollies also came from anime culture. And now, it's the number one refuge of closeted creeps all over the world. For whatever reason, there is also a plethora of anime and manga revolving around incest. Regardless of how absurd it is, it's a theme that has been pretty much normalized at this point. And all of that is just the tip of the iceberg. Though I will mostly refrain from delving into things like Goro, Hentai, and the whole fixation on tentacles thing. As I've already mentioned, enough eccentricities as it is. What is worth focusing on is the fact that none of these things came out in a vacuum. These abominations are only being supplied because there is a demand for them. Additionally, despite being profusely present in the dark recesses of the internet, on websites such as 4chan, DeviantArt, and Rule34, they are not at all limited to it. At least, in Japan, there is an entire industry of professional animation studios that are enthusiastically willing to go along with seemingly any kind of perversion, regardless of how unspeakably disgusting it may be. The only remaining question is, who are they? Because if these manga writers, animators, and convention runners are complicit with the demands of the pathetic perverts that like consuming these sorts of things, then it follows that they must also have some kind of major malfunction. That's what we will find out today. These are the Anime Degenerates. The first person we're going to be talking about today is Nobuhiro Watsuki. Born Nobuhiro Nishiwaki, he began writing and illustrating manga while he was still in high school. And like many other aspiring authors, he sent his material to many different publications, hoping that something of his would get picked up. In 1987, Nobuhiro wrote a one-shot called Teacher Pawn, which has seemingly never been digitized and is not available online. But apparently, it got an honorable mention in the 33rd edition of the Tezuka Awards, which is hosted semi-annually by Shueisha through their main publication, The Weekly Shonen Jump. If you are not familiar with what that is, it's pretty much the central anthology manga magazine that is responsible for pretty much every shonen title you can think of. Shonen being Japanese media directed at young men. Naruto, Dragon Ball, One Piece, Yu-Gi-Oh, Hunter x Hunter, Fist of the North Star, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, you name it, and it was probably published in the weekly Shonen Jump. Given its seniority, since it was in circulation since 1968, and how much of a cultural linchpin it was for anyone and everyone interested in manga, it set the golden standard for aspiring writers. So you can imagine how meaningful it is to get an award through it. One of the committee members responsible for choosing who gets the awards is the legendary Akira Toriyama, creator of Dragon Ball, and another, Osamu Tezuka, the man who the awards are named after, made Astro Boy. It's safe to say that being noticed by names like these are no small feat, and it certainly inspired Nobuhiro to keep trying his hand at manga. A few years later, in 1991, another one of his mangas, a story about a schoolgirl who was contacted by a ghost, won the Hop Step Award, which was yet another award held by Shueisha. This gave him the break he needed into the manga world, and soon after graduating, he would move to Tokyo, where he would work as an assistant to Yoichi... Taka... I fucking hate these names, holy sh**. Yoichi Takahashi and Takeshi Obata, the latter of which authored the well-known manga, anime, and live-action movies under the name Death Note. Eventually, another one of his mangas would get the attention of Shueisha, though this time, it wasn't just for an award. Nobuhiro would write three one-shots, 
two of them being centered around a character named Ruroni Kenshin. When Kenshin's stories became serialized and Nobuhiro was hired by Shuisha to continually write for it, they would be published under the title of Samurai X, which, if you are a surface-level anime buff, you have definitely heard about before. Samurai X would go on to amass over 70 million copies in circulation from 1994 to 1999, making it to the top 20 most published manga ever. Evidently, this is something that can be said of very few publications. Nobuhiro quickly made his way into the Mangaka Hall of Fame, and would go on to make another manga as well. Meanwhile, Samurai X got anime and movie adaptations that spread its fame globally, the most recent of which was a live-action trilogy in the early 2010s, and another film supposedly in the works right now. Typically, most mangakas, after achieving success, tend to adopt a low profile and enjoy the fruits of their labor mostly unseen. Nobuhiro, on the other hand, would not be as graceful. In November of 2017, Tokyo Metropolitan Police were leading an investigation into an unrelated incident of the sale of CP, when they discovered a link that led to Nobuhiro. Specifically, he was suspected of having bought videos of girls around 10 years old. When his house and office in Tokyo were searched, the suspicion would be confirmed, as they would find not one or two, but around a hundred DVDs, all containing extremely illegal and disgusting material. After his arrest, he was charged and interrogated, almost instantly admitting to it and confessing, even specifying his own preference and content to the officers. I liked girls in the higher grades of elementary school to the second grade of junior high. In response to this news, Shuisha quickly suspended the publishing of new episodes of the Samurai X manga, putting it on an indefinite hiatus until Nobuhiro's situation was cleared up by the police. However, they didn't know what to do with the intellectual property of Samurai X, seeing as it was still under their ownership. Up until this point, Nobuhiro was widely admired, having mentored other illustrious manga artists, such as the creator of One Piece, Echihiro Oda. Not only that, but he also had a wife who was totally unaware of what he was into until it came out in the news. I can't imagine how disturbing it is to discover that this author, who undoubtedly had access to multitudes of minors over the course of his decades, is a predator. What is also disturbing is the fact that the law that completely prohibited possession of CP in Japan was only ratified in July 2014. Even then, it only allows for the person convicted of violating it to be imprisoned for one year, with a fine of 1 million yen. Which, though it may sound like a large fine, equates to a little less than $9,000 USD. To add insult to injury, Nobuhiro did not even receive the maximum penalty, having to pay only a fine of 200,000 yen, meaning only about $1,800. The information online indicates that he wasn't condemned to spend even a day in an actual prison. Though horrifying, it's not that surprising coming from a country whose age of consent is 13. Less than a year later, Samurai X continued to be published most likely with Nobuhiro still profiting from it. However, this wasn't the first time that a manga artist connected to Shonen Jump would be charged with this kind of crime. Two decades prior to this, you had the story of Mitsutoshi Shimabukuru. Mitsutoshi was also an author, though on a much smaller scale than Nobuhiro. Debuting professionally in 1996, he also had a manga published by Shui Isha, the title of which when translated to English reads, The Tale of a Leader in the End of a Century, Takeshi. It was actually pretty popular, winning two awards within three years of the beginning of its publication, one of them being the 2001 Shogakukan Manga Award for Children's Anime, which is the oldest and one of the biggest manga awards in Japan. Mitsutoshi's glory, however, was extremely short-lived. In 2002, the circulation of his manga would be abruptly paused, as he would be caught in a scandal involving an underage girl. On August 7th, Kanagawa Prefectural Police and Isaka Police Station would arrest Mitsutoshi for acts that contradict Japan's child prostitution laws. Basically, a year before, in November 2001, Mitsutoshi used the Japanese equivalent of Tinder to talk to a 16-year-old girl through a pseudonym. When they arranged to meet each other at a hotel in Yokohama, he would pay her 80,000 yen, currently equivalent to about $570, presumably for the girl to have intercourse with him. Though he was temporarily let go as the police investigated, he was rearrested later the same month on the 29th of August. The detectives found that Mitsutoshi's most recent offense was just the last of five that they could gather hard evidence of, meaning that Mitsutoshi had been seeing schoolgirls for hire for a while. 
Two months later, he was found guilty and sentenced to two years in prison. However, his sentence was suspended for four years, meaning he would be on probation instead of serving any time inside a prison cell. His manga, which up until then was under revision, was discontinued by Shueisha, which I think is the least that they could have done in the face of a conviction as serious as his. Unfortunately, this penalty lasted for less than two years, as in 2004, he was working for Shueisha again, making a sports comedy manga called Ring. And a year later, he was authorized to continue his work on Takeshi. The only difference this time around was that his manga was being published in Super Jump instead of the weekly Shonen Jump, which was a minor demotion. This, too, didn't last very long. In 2008, he returned to work for the weekly Shonen Jump to produce his manga, Toriko. Not only was it serialized, but it became the magazine's top seller, with over 25 million copies in circulation, and it was eventually adapted into an anime. Mitsutoshi would go on to work on Toriko for the next eight years. Toriko would go on to be nominated and win a multitude of awards, none of which took any issue with the fact that it was being run by a man who was convicted of hiring children for intercourse. In 2011, Echihiro Oda, yes, the same guy who made One Piece and was mentored by Nobuhiro Watsuki, collaborated with Mitsutoshi to make a crossover one-shot episode between Toriko and One Piece. He's actually still active to this day, having one-shot stories of his published in the weekly Shonen Jump and Grand Jump magazines, one of which, being called Build King, has recently been serialized as well. His crimes have been forgotten by seemingly everyone, though probably not by the victims. Now, it would be very easy to lay the blame exclusively at the feet of Japan, for its culture of impunity and looking the other way when it comes to crimes of this nature. While sure, Japan is largely at fault for allowing this kind of thing to fester and proliferate, this problem is far larger than that. Many Western companies are also involved in the production, publishing, and distribution of these pieces of media. Toriko's manga was being published by Viz Media, an American company, while the anime for it was being produced and distributed by Funimation and Toei Animation. In addition to that, it's hosted on Crunchyroll to this day. This necessarily means that none of the people along the way took issue with doing business with a convicted predator. None of the advertisement companies that put ads on Crunchyroll mind either, evidently. Save for a few people on Twitter who have commented on the situation, the public is equally as careless, hence why the companies don't feel they need to sacrifice whatever profits they're making off of it for PR. I guess that's as good of a hint as to what their priorities are as we'll ever get. And while it's not totally surprising that corporations will look the other way with sex scandals of this severity, it's nonetheless still pretty disappointing. With all this business coming his way, Mitsutoshi must certainly see a pretty large bottom line, considering that recidivism, the tendency of a convicted criminal to reoffend for adult sex offenders is a virtual certainty, I must wonder what he's been up to in the past two decades, especially now that he knows what made the police take notice of him, and that even if he does get caught, he'll get away with a slap on the wrist. I can only wonder how he's been enjoying his undeserved freedom and piles of money. Let's hope it's been with only legal, non-predatory activities. I may have to risk sounding like a broken record here, but can you believe that there is yet another Shonen Jump author that has been convicted for a serious offense? I honestly wouldn't blame you for never having heard about this one, since his case is unknown to the point of there not even being a Wikipedia page for him, and the only confirmed images we have of him are from when he was being arrested. His name is Sutaya Matsumoto though the majority of people know him by Tatsuya Matsuki, the pen name he goes by when he's working on manga. Since January 2018, Matsuki has been working on Act Age, a series about Kei Yonagi, an orphan schoolgirl whose objective is to become a successful actress, who catches the eye of a renowned director who sees potential in her. If you're even moderately responsible, this already sounds a little creepy to you. However, this story did achieve some success, which prompted Shueisha to keep publishing it in the weekly Shonen Jump. They had already commissioned versions of it in English and Spanish, and as of June 2020, Act Age had amassed an impressive 3 million copies in circulation. It was nominated for awards and considered one of the mangas most likely to eventually receive an anime adaptation, with a stage play based on its story already in development. All of this made for a stellar set of accomplishments for Matsuki, who, just five years prior, was graduating from the Nihon University College of Art, not for something related to mangas per se, 
but for film. Despite not being directly related to the field he ultimately intended to move into, during his time working as an editor and screenplay writer, he got to hone his skills as an author, which evidently transferred well to his work as a mangaka. However, regardless of his ambitions, he wasn't very good at drawing, which hindered his ability to put together original work on his own. This problem would eventually be solved when Tsutaya would meet Shiro Usazaki, a female illustrator who would later illustrate Act Age. Tsutaya recounts how they met in an interview he gave to Anon News. Originally, before my debut, there was a time when I drew a crappy manga and posted it on Twitter. It started when someone retweeted it, and Usazaki reacted, exactly two years ago. Also, when I saw Usazaki-san's illustrations on Twitter, I thought, this person is really good at drawing. At that time, I won the manga award Stoken Pro, which is run by Weekly Shonen Jump and targets people who want to write original works. Here, he refers to Stoken Pro, which, for the unaware, is an award event held by Shuisha to promote small, independent mangakas and give them a shot at becoming professionals. Shiro would also weigh in. Until then, I had only drawn pictures of my favorite characters, but I wanted to draw manga. I couldn't write the story myself, so it was an attractive original story. When I first saw it on Twitter, even though it was drawn as rough as a draft, I was already interested in the character at that stage. Here, they are talking about the prototype for Act Age, a one-shot that took place five years before the main story, which was published in the Weekly Shonen Jump under the name Welcome to Asagaya Art High School Film Section. By all accounts, it seemed that Tsutaya was good at working with others, making him a perfect candidate to work on a manga where he would write it and someone else would illustrate it. And he showed no signs of strange behavior. And so, you can imagine it came as a complete shock to everyone when, two years later on August 8th, 2020, Tsutaya would be arrested for what the Tokyo Metropolitan Police described as performing obscene acts on two junior high school aged girls. Furthermore, they quickly connected him to crimes that had happened months before his arrest. In June 18th of the same year, Tatsuya, who was riding a bike at the time this took place, rode up behind a junior high school girl and sexually harassed her. I should qualify right now that, in Japan, junior high school girls are aged 12 to 15 of the oldest. As if that weren't enough, an hour later, another girl who was completely unrelated to the first incident would also be harassed by the same man. The police only tentatively connected these crimes to Tatsuya at first, since their suspicions were based on the fact that his appearance was very similar to the culprit who was caught doing these things in CCTV surveillance cameras. However, during interrogation, Tatsuya would confess that it was him beyond the shadow of a doubt. The editorial department of the Weekly Shonen Jump would release a statement about the situation on Twitter, which, when translated, read as follows. News from the editorial department. The editorial department takes the matter of the news reports on Mr. Tatsuya Matsuki, the author of Act Age, which is serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump, very seriously. We will take appropriate action after confirming the facts. We sincerely apologize to all our readers and others for any inconvenience and concern this may cause. Perhaps this may have evoked feelings of genuine concern for justice in the newbies, but any manga aficionado worth his salt already knew this was done solely for PR purposes. Thankfully, this event got enough traction so that public pressure was weighing heavily on them, leading to the cancellation of the manga and the ceasing of the distribution of the already printed volumes in circulation. And the company, Hori Pro, who was orchestrating a theater play based on Act Age, also dropped its production. Though the publishers treated this situation a bit better than they usually do, law enforcement was as relaxed as usual. The resolution reached in court was an 18-month sentence, which is as much as the law allows. However, this sentence is suspended, and Sutaya is on parole because, as the defense put it, he was already sufficiently punished by having his manga cancelled. A couple of weeks after Sutaya's arrest, Shiro, the artist, would comment on the situation in a much more heartfelt and sincere manner on her Twitter account. First of all, I would like to express my deepest sympathies to the victim and their family. In the midst of her shock and fear, I think it was a very courageous act for her to speak up and not let go of her anger at having her dignity violated. I fully accept the Jump Editorial Department's decision regarding the end of the Act Age series, as well as the response to planning books, goods, etc. due to this incident. Thank you for always supporting Act Age. This time, I have to finish the work in the middle of the road, and I, like everyone else, 
am very disappointed. However, it must be absolutely avoided that the voices of the work become a burden on the victims. Of course, it is not the victim's fault that the work ends. It is not wrong that the victims raise their voices and that they endured the pain and did not give in to the groping and sexual crimes. It is the result of doing the right thing right. She was hailed for how she dealt with the situation, and deservedly so, in my estimation. This will be a first for this video a degenerate that isn't employed by Shueisha. Though his site mentions 2002 as the first time a manga magazine published a one-shot of his, his debut with a properly serialized manga would only happen in 2008, with a story called Princess Candle, the synopsis of which reads, Europe in the late Middle Ages. A princess with long, golden curly hair and waxy white skin was sent to a remote convent. Black-haired, brown-skinned princess flew the princess's soul maid cannot get used to her poor life in the monastery and causes a lot of trouble. But Flu is undeterred. Her only wish was to return the beautiful princess to her throne someday. And as if to trample on Flu's thoughts, men soon came to the monastery. Despite the very specific description of the protagonist appearance, it's not uncommon at all for manga. Both the art and story seem innocuous enough and not at all exploitative. You could even say it's quite tasteful. However, in the same year, he would also publish a one-shot called She Was a Slut Rather Than a Girl through a magazine called Comic Beam. And to put it mildly, if I were to put an uncensored part of it on screen, this video would either be demonetized or removed from YouTube entirely. His very next published book was also about two schoolgirls, one of them being small and the other gigantic, who, during their school festival, decided to host a maid cafe. This premise, though still not explicit, is a tad strange considering how popular the giantess fetish is in certain circles. Putting that together with the schoolgirls holding a maid cafe makes this, at the very least, an eyebrow raiser. To dispel any doubt that he had a vested interest in the sexual innuendos in the undertones of his stories, his next work listed on his page isn't a manga he wrote, but one he illustrated, about an earl, meaning a member of the royalty, who lived in a mansion with a bunch of maids. The cover makes it clear what kind of tone this story was supposed to have. It's a harem story, where a bunch of girls are going after one, usually small, shy, and inexperienced guy. Any semblance of normalcy in the themes of his works would totally disintegrate. Once, in 2014, he would start producing the manga that he became famously known for. Please tell me, Galko-chan. To put it simply, it's a story about Galko, a schoolgirl with comically huge breasts. And remember, this story takes place in a school, which necessarily means that Galko is a minor in the duration of these stories. The website for the manga reflects this already extremely creepy concept, as they list all of the covers, one of which is Galko in a bikini bra, and another of her with transparent socks showing her feet. Unfortunately, it seems there's no law, or at least cultural shame, against this kind of thing in Japan whatsoever. To make matters worse, Kenya's website also links to a gallery and a pixiv, something akin to a mashup between OnlyFans and DeviantArt, if you can fathom something as truly unholy as that, both of which are rife with illustrations of Galko that range from lewd to explicitly pornographic along with other illustrations, some of which constitute drawn CP. At this point, it's beyond the shadow of a doubt that Kenya is a pervert who expressed his fantasies vicariously through the manga. Not that anyone cared very much, as it was soon made into an anime, which, by the way, was hosted by Crunchyroll. The absolute lack of standards never ceases to amaze me. The only question left is if Kenya's fantasies manifested anywhere else besides manga. Well, of course it did. On the 20th of December 2020, the Aichi Prefectural Police arrested Kenya for violating the Japanese Customs Act, which made it illegal to import prohibited items. And what were those prohibited items exactly? A total of six photo books of naked minors imported from Germany. In his statement to the police, he would say, I really wanted a collection of nude photographs of foreign children, which is not available in Japan, and I couldn't stand it. But this was just his first arrest. As the investigation went on, they eventually searched his house, where they would find a whopping 46 photo books of nude children. In the wake of his arrest, Comic Walker, the digital manga service owned by Kotakawa, 
one of the largest publishing conglomerates in Japan, suspended the serialization of Galco, which probably should have never begun in the first place. When the investigation was concluded, the case moved forward and Kenya stood trial, being handed a sentence of 14 months in prison. However, as always, this sentence was suspended in favor of three years of parole. Long after the resolution of this case, Kenya would post a statement on his Twitter regarding his legal situation. I purchased and possessed these books between 2020 and 2021 for my own personal interest. I did not purchase them to use them as reference materials for my comic books. I have consistently admitted my guilt since the initial police interrogation and have told the truthful story. I have no intention of filing an appeal. The verdict against me is expected to become final. I am deeply ashamed of my own lack of awareness and shallow behavior. I will strictly admonish myself so that I will not commit the crime again. I am truly sorry. I'm not sure how rehabilitated you can truly get when you're still commercializing drawn images of teenagers with giant tits on your personal website. What's even more insane is that it wasn't legally required of him to stop doing that as a demonstration that he wouldn't foster those interests anymore. Hopefully, we never see him reoffend, but to say the least, hope wears thin in the face of such glaring negligence. This one's a little different than the others, seeing as we won't be talking about an author or illustrator, but a soundtrack composer. Hidekazu Tanaka is a 35-year-old anime musician who has been making songs for anime openings and endings, as well as for video game OSDs since roughly around the 2010s. Perhaps the most famous instance of his work on anime is the opening for Idol Master Cinderella Girl's Star, which has garnered over 2.7 million views on YouTube since its upload seven years ago. This was particularly impressive since, at the time, he was the youngest composer for the Idol Master soundtrack. However, this is just one of the many songs he's done over the course of his career. For the majority of his time and activity, he worked under Monica, a record label concentrated on contracting their in-house musicians to score cartoons, dramas, movies, and even video games. It was through their connections that Hidekazu managed to be a part of the team responsible for scoring the Pokemon Journey series. The list of intellectual properties he's worked for in the decade he was working for Monica is too long for me to even attempt to name specific items. He's really made his way around. He also has a YouTube channel where he would often post updates about the newest developments and the tracks he was working on, as well as sporadic streams of himself playing Animal Crossing. Overall, he appeared to be a very friendly personality, with no signs of creepy or otherwise strange behavior. However, he would eventually quit his position at Monica without much explanation, in order to become a freelancer. This move was hailed by many of his fans, who saw this as him being freed up to do less orthodox work. However, whatever prospects of him engaging in innovative endeavors with his work in music would become a lot less likely very soon. The Metropolitan Police Department of Tokyo would arrest Hidekazu for what they'd legally recognized as attempted forced indecency. In their description of the crime Hidekazu was committing, they said he walked up behind a teenage girl in a bicycle parking area near a train station, grabbed her hand against her will, and said obscene things to her. Though what exactly he said hasn't been revealed. Fortunately, this incident happened near a neighborhood police station outpost, to where the girl ran and reported it in the same day. When investigating, the police pulled CCTV footage that revealed he was following her before the harassment occurred. He was promptly arrested, and soon after, his name began being pulled from credits on the animes he'd worked on. When questioned by the police about what he had done, he simply stated, I found a woman at a train station, thought she was my type, and I followed her on the train. Either he's done this for a long time, or he had a psychotic break. Because that explanation sounds way too straightforward for the stalking he's describing, to not be something he's totally comfortable with. Because of the very recent nature of this incident, we still don't have the information as far as how it'll turn out in court. But, knowing how things go in Japan, I wouldn't be too confident he'll get any kind of real punishment. Hidekazu never posted anything on any of his social media accounts addressing the situation. And his last tweet is just a series of pictures of a meal he was having, with some of the people in the replies after the fact saying things like, Last Supper. As previously stated, a lax attitude towards this kind of abhorrent behavior is not exclusive to Japan. In fact, it's a worldwide issue. 
John Lay is the founder of a four-day-long convention called Anime Matsuri, which has been held annually since 2007 in Houston, Texas, and is still active to this day. Despite not being a big event when compared to other conventions, it does seem to be held in some kind of esteem as it continues to draw in big guests to this day. It has just about everything you would expect an anime convention to have. Cosplay contests, gaming events, LARPing, maid cafes, workshops where people who aspire to be manga authors or anime producers can be directly taught by artists who work in the field, and the list goes on. However, also following the tradition of many conventions, it was involved in a series of controversies. A good deal of it is actually par for the course when it comes to conventions, such as conflicts when it comes to financial settlements with the artists that are invited, or investors that end up not getting reimbursed. However bad it may be, it's not exactly abnormal for these situations to come up whenever there's a multitude of people all involved in one single big project. What isn't par for the course is that the director and founder of the convention has been accused of being a serial sex offender. After the 2015 Anime Matsuri event, multiple women came forward and reported having been sexually harassed by John Lay, ranging from unwanted touching and jokes all the way up to lifting up women's skirts and smacking their asses unrequested. Nina Ray Jinders, one of the many women that came forward with the information about Lei, took it to her personal blog to describe exactly what went on and how the harassment came to be. Our first meeting in person was to shoot promo pictures for Anime Matsuri 2015. He visited Europe and invited me to travel with him and his family to London and have a trip to Disneyland Paris, all expenses paid. I declined the Disneyland trip, even though I would love to go there again, work was more important, and paid for my own trip to stay in London. The first evening, I had dinner together with John and his friend. There, the sexual jokes and comments started to increase. He also talked a lot about someone from, company and name removed, sucking his d for favors, and stories like that. But when we had a day together with his wife and kids, he suddenly kept quiet. On this trip, the idea of hosting an event in Germany was started. A couple months later, he invited me on a trip to Japan. Of course, also all expenses paid. I didn't go with him, and he continued to use that against me for the next few months to try and make me feel bad. This post was followed by screenshots of their conversations in the Facebook chat, which are as depressing as they are creepy. As John asks for her to send him pictures, supposedly for promotional purposes related to the event, only to then qualify it as naked pics, of course. Additionally, in his invitations for her to go on a free trip with him to Japan, he would also qualify them with, We are staying in one room with one bed. So, if you're going to give me a speech about sleeping on the ground, and being conservative, and what happens in Japan won't stay in Japan, Save it. Yeah, quite the uh, gentleman. Following her story, another girl, Stephanie Tai, would also explain her falling out with the anime Matsuri director. Once, he tried to lift up my jabot, an ornamental fabric that goes over the chest, to see what was underneath. I often wear a jabot over a tank top since it gets really hot in Houston. Not wanting to deal with someone trying to peek at my chest, I immediately slapped his hand away. Ty would also follow up her story with pictures of her conversations with John. Stephanie. I await the exciting news then. If you're looking for stand-ins again, I'd be happy to volunteer. John. I have lots of exciting news. Maybe a bit too exciting. You might have orgasms. Stephanie. I don't think I'll get that excited, but okay, lol. John. Oh, really? When was the last time you had an orgasm? Stephanie. You don't need to know. John. Yes, I do. Please tell. In response to the accusations, John would post a response to his personal blog. As a disclaimer, I would like to point out that I joke a lot with my friends or people I consider close. If you are offended by sexual innuendos, dirty talk, or comments about boobs and orgasms, you should not be my friend. Online or offline. This means no disrespect, and I would suggest not engaging in conversation with me. I act this way with my friends regardless of gender. And as my friend, you should make it perfectly clear that you are uncomfortable with my conversation. I would respect you enough to stop joking. But because his blog was mostly unknown and not really a public platform, he would also release a statement through the Anime Matsuri PR representative, Kelly Kimberly, where he would say, I am extremely sorry that my attempts at humor have offended some people. When I learned of concerns of some former business associates, I was at first surprised and disappointed that people I considered friends held these beliefs. I became defensive and did not react well. Given a couple of days to reflect, I realized that my sense of humor may not be well received, 
and I had to take that to heart. I have subsequently completed an online sexual harassment course that I believe will make me more aware and sensitive to how my actions are perceived by others, and I will continue working on this. Additionally, I voluntarily submitted my resignation from the post as Kawaii Ambassador on Wednesday, June 24th, after there was a call by some for me to do so. This has been an eye-opening experience for me and my family. I feel terrible about this, and sincerely apologize to those I have offended. I hope my actions have demonstrated my sincerity in wanting to maintain my good name and that of Anime Matsuri. Of course, he only said this after it had seemingly hit him in his pockets, as people were threatening to no longer attend and cease associating their names with Anime Matsuri. At the time, people actually gave the statement some credence, since this was the first time they had heard something like that about Lei, and gave him the benefit of the doubt. As time went on, however, many people would come to the conclusion that he didn't deserve that benefit. Around 2018, during the wake of the hashtag MeToo movement, when many people were coming forward about the cases of sexual harassment that had happened to them in the past, so too did Tyler Willis, a fashion vlogger that was prominent in the Lolita fashion community. Through the Facebook page, Last Week Lolita News, she would release two separate videos, alleging that John Lay hadn't just engaged in inappropriate acts with adult women, but also with minors. John's response was to simply send her a cease and desist letter. The letter, which was signed by his lawyer, concluded with, I further demand that you make a public apology on social media to my client's Anime Matsuri convention, Shop in Wonderland, and Kathy Cat immediately. If my demand is not met by January 8th, 2018, I will be forced to file suit against you for trademark infringement, harassment, defamation, and slander. If you're familiar with the Streisand effect at all, then you'll also be aware that silencing interesting or controversial information usually just makes it spread even more. This backfired badly on them, as a small movement called Boycott Anime Matsuri began spreading the information about Lei's actions, including his attempt to cover it all up and intimidate Tyler. It also started to divulge more accounts of John harassing women that dated far, far before he was holding conventions. The story goes, I started going to Planet Zero, John's old arcade, when I was 15 years old, almost every weekend. I quickly became a regular and got to know John and Denise, his wife, even before their first son was born. When Denise wasn't there, John would often joke with me, slap my ass as he walked by, or make inappropriate jokes about my wardrobe. I was at that age where any sexual attention was good, so I never said anything. The campaign gained a lot of traction and support on social media, and consequently, many of the people who were planning to attend Anime Matsuri cancelled their appearances. However, this campaign has not succeeded in its objective, since not only are the conventions still happening every year, and drawing attendees, but to this day, they're still under John Lay's direction. Obviously, no one delights in shutting down an anime convention, considering there's not that many places for weebs to congregate in mass. But in the eyes of many, as long as Lay is present, the environment won't ever be safe. Every fandom and culture has problems, sure. However, when these problems are being overlooked, or worse, promoted on an industrial scale, that's no longer just the niche's problem. It's everyone's problem. A lot of really young kids are being introduced into anime through social media. And while that's cool, some of them could end up stumbling onto something very dangerous for them. Not only can they accidentally be exposed to content that might be very disturbing, they can just as easily go to a convention and be targeted by one of the creeps who like anime for all the wrong reasons. There's an online initiative called Fix the Broken Staircase that is working on cataloging people who are known for attending conventions and may pose a threat. And let me tell you, the list is not short. Much like in the case of the furry community, it's not everyone and it's certainly not even half of the people involved in the fandom that are to blame. However, it's still an amount that most should be very uncomfortable with. At this point, it should be obvious that predators will always try to occupy positions that give them a social justification for being around their victims. All of this is to say, be vigilant, because you never know what kind of anime degenerate could be out there. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone. Not that funny anymore